Well, hello there, and welcome back to Storytime for Kids. I'm Mrs. McCurley, and we are going to do some more poetry today. Our first poem is called On Imagination, and it's by Phyllis Wheatley. And she has such an interesting story. She was originally born in West Africa in 1793, but when she was eight years old, she was kidnapped and brought by ship to America, Boston specifically, where she was then sold to a family as a slave. However, she learned to read and write, and she was one of the first African-American women ever to publish a book of poetry. On Imagination By various works, Imperial Queen, we see how bright their forms, how decked with pomp by thee, thy wondrous acts, in beauteous order stand, and all attest how potent is thy hand. From Helicon's refulgent heights attend, the sacred fire, and my attempts to befriend, to tell her glories with a faithful tongue, ye blooming graces, triumph in my song. Now here, now there, the roving fancy flies, till some loved object strikes the wondering eyes, whose silken fetters all the senses bind, and soft captivity involves the mind. Imagination. Who can sing thy force, or who describe the swiftness of thy course? Soaring through air to find the bright abode. Till imperial palace of the thundering God, we on thy pinions can surpass the wind and leave the rolling universe behind. From star to star, the mental optics rove, measure the skies, and range the realms above. There, in one view, we grasp the mighty whole. Or, with new worlds, amaze the unbound. Soul. Though winter frowns to fancy's ruptured eyes, the fields may flourish and gay scenes arise, the frozen deeps may break their iron bands, and mid their waters, murmuring over the sands, their flora may resume her fragrant reign, and with her flowery riches deck the plain. Sylvanus may diffuse his honors round, and all the forest may with leaves be crowned. Showers may descend. The rich gems disclose, and nectar sparkle like the morning rose. Such is thy power, nor are thine orders vain. O thou the leader of the mental train, in full perfection all thy works are wrought, and thine the scepter o'er the realms of thought. Before thy throne the subject passions bow, of subject passions sovereign we would know. At thy command, Joy rushes to the heart, and through the glowing veins the spirits dart. Fancy might now her silken pinions dry, to rise from the earth and sweep the expanse on high. From Titan's bed now might her roar arise, her cheeks all glowing with celestial dyes, while a pure stream of light o'erflows the skies. The monarch of the day I might behold, and all the mountains tip with radiant gold. I, reluctant, leave thy pleasing views, which fancy dresses to delight the muse. Winter, austere, forbades me to aspire. Northern tempests damp the rising fire. They chill the tides of fancy's flowing sea. Cease then, my song. Cease the unequal play. Just beautiful. Our next poem is called My Shadow by Robert Louis Stevenson, who's a Scottish writer most known for his famous, amazing book, Treasure Island. Let's read his poem. I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. He's very, very like me from the heels up to the head, and I see him jump before me when I jump into my bed. The funniest thing about him is the way he likes to grow. Not at all like pauper children, which is always very slow, for sometimes he shoots up taller like an Indian rubber ball. And sometimes he gets so little, there's none of him at all. He hasn't got a notion of how children ought to play. He can only make a fool of me in every sort of way. He stays so close beside me. He's a coward. I think shame to stick to Nursie as that shadow sticks to me. One morning, 
very early, before the sun was up, I rose and found the shining dew on every butterfly. But my lazy little shadow, hmm, like an errant sleepyhead, had stayed at home behind me and was fast asleep in bed. <laughs> now, our last three poems are by a writer and poet named Mary Howitt from the 1800s from England. This first one is called Buttercups and Daisies. Buttercups and Daisies, oh, pretty flowers, coming ere the springtime to tell of sunny hours. While the trees are leafless, while the fields are bare, buttercups and daisies spring up here and there. Ere the snowdrop peepeth, ere the rusk is gold, ere the early primrose opes its paley gold, somewhere on a sunny bank, buttercups are bright. Somewhere among the frozen grass, peeps the daisy white. Little hardy flowers, like to children poor, playing in their sturdy health by their mother's door. Purple with the north wind, yet alert and bold. Fearing not and caring not, though they be a cold. What to them is weather? What are stormy showers? Buttercups and daisies? gave them hardship and a life of care, gave them likewise hardy strength and patient hearts to bear. Welcome, yellow buttercups, welcome, daisies white. Ye are in my spirit, visioned a delight, coming ere the springtime of sunny hours to tell, speaking to our hearts of him who doth all things well. The Little Woodman do you know the little wood mouse? Pretty little thing. It sits among the forest leaves beside the forest spring. Its fur is red as the red chestnut, and it is small and slim. It leads a life most innocent within the forest dip. It is a timid, gentle creature and seldom comes in sight. It has a long, wiry tail and eyes both black and bright. It makes its nest of soft, dry moss in a hole so deep and strong, and there it sleeps secure and warm the dreary winter long. And though it keeps no calendar, it knows when flowers are springing. It waketh to its summer life when nightingales are singing. Upon the boughs the squirrel sits, wood mouse please below, and plenty of food it finds itself where the beach chestnut grow. In the hedge sparrow's nest he sits when its summer brood is fled and picks the berries from the bough of the hawthorn overhead. I saw a little wood mouse once, like Oberon in his hall, with green green moss beneath his feet, sit under a mushroom palm. I saw him sit and eat his dinner all under the forest tree, his dinner of chestnut ripe and red, and he ate it heartily. I wish you could have seen him there. It did my spirit good to see the small thing God had made thus eating in the wood. I saw that he regarded them, those creatures, weak and small. Their table in the wild is spread by him who cares for all. This last poem is called The Hummingbird. The hummingbird? The hummingbird, so fairy like and bright. It lives among the sunny flowers creature of delight. In the radiant islands of the east where fragrant spices grow, a thousand thousand hummingbirds go glancing shh, shh, to and fro. Like living fires they flit about, scarce larger than a bee, among the broad palmetto leaves and through the fan palm tree, and in those wild and verdant woods where stately mosses tower, where hangs from branching tree to tree the scarlet passion flower, where on the mighty river banks the plate and Amazon, the caiman like an old tree trunk, lies basking in the sun. There builds her nest the hummingbird within the ancient wood, her nest of silky cotton down and rears her tiny brood. 
she hangs it to a slender twig where waves of light and free as the campanero tolls his song and rocks the mighty tree. All crimson in her shining breast, like to the red, red rose. Her wing is the changeful green and blue that the neck of the peacock shows. Thou happy, happy hummingbird, no winter round thee lures. Thou never sawst a leafless tree, nor land without sweet flowers. A rain of summer, joyfulness, to thee her life is given. Thy food, the honey from the flower, thy drink, the dew from heaven. Isn't that beautiful? I don't know about you, but I love hummingbirds. Where I live here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we get them a lot in the summertime, and they're like a little piece of heaven brought down on earth. I hope you enjoyed our poems for today, and until our next video, be sure to subscribe, and happy story time. Bye!